Well, our next guest throughout his career has been recognized with numerous awards and honors, both in South Africa and internationally. He's also been a vocal advocate for social justice and reconciliation in post-apartheid South Africa. And he can tell you himself because the list of honors goes on and on. But he was recently named the Style Icon winner for the upcoming South African Style Awards 2024. And he's here in style, none other than John Carney. It's been been a long time. <laughs> it has. Um, yes. I'm so pleased to see you are in good health and in high spirits. Yes. When you're employed, when you have a job, you're in good spirits. <laughs> Tell an artist he doesn't know when the next job is gloomy. Oh, yeah. And blaming everybody and blaming even the climate for not creating work. <laughs> right. And, and they will find excuses. But, you know, the amazing thing about you, and, and every time I look back at this incredible career of yours, I'm just dumbstruck by the things that you've achieved. And I don't, I don't say that to just butter you up. You don't need that from me. You've, you've had awards and accolades and recognition. And I think it's, it's great that during your lifetime, so many artists only get the recognition after they're gone. You Absolutely. Know, Van Gogh never sold a painting, right? And, and yet, we are lucky enough to be able to tell you how much we love you while you're here. I mean, your contribution, not only to the things I've already mentioned, but to the fact that our stories were able to be shared internationally. Mm -hmm. Through the apartheid years, post-apartheid, you were a man who was prolific. I mean, you put together some of our most famous stuff. You know, you've got Sizwe Banzi's Dead, we've got The Island, and that was in the 70s. And as you move into the rest of it, I mean, it's just incredible how your career has become more than, more than I suppose even you expected. Could you ever have imagined this when you were a young man starting out? Not at all. I wanted to be a lawyer. Really? I told my father, I'm going to be a lawyer. And my father says, no. It's too dangerous because I know you. You're going to end up being a human rights lawyer in apartheid time. I've lost my son. My other uncle already is on Robben Island. And my other son is in trouble. So please, could you choose something nice? Safe. <laughs> and safe. But, I mean, listen, there's no doubt that you were not playing it safe. No. The rebel streak came out anyway. The funniest thing, Gareth, is that... <laughs> Not a single production was planned, even in choice, that this is going to be an expose of the apartheid system. I was always attracted by the truth and the challenges of the creating the work, artistic challenges. And suddenly when you step back and you look at what you just created, by some kind of miracle, it mirrors our society at that time. Even with Sees where Banzi is dead, we were laughing at this guy who took a picture of himself with a pipe and a cigarette lit in those Bantu photographic studios downtown. Yeah. We knew he was going to send it to his wife. He says, I'm now in Port Elizabeth. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's, there was even a plastic flowers and a phone, you know? <laughs> So that was the joke about between Winston John and Arthur Fugard and I. But then we stopped, says, why would he do that? Why would this man, he looks decent, he's in his 50s. Mm. And dismissing it, I said, I got his passbook in order, dismissing it. So let's get on with what we were talking about. They said, stop. Arthur said, what do you mean passbook in order? I said, it's 91 pages of a nightmare. Even Jesus Christ would never get it right. If we were to come here, the Boers will arrest him because there will be one clause he's contravened. Mm -hmm. And that was the birth of Sizwebans. Following just this man who wants to send this picture to his wife. So where does it come from? Winston's from King Williamstown. says, oh, he's from, he comes from my side of town. He's from King Williamstown. How many children does he have? Oh, he's got four children just like me. And it went on like that. This is how the story was this built. This is how the story was built. Same with the island, same with all the plays I've written. I'm always fascinated by the journey of the individual. If I just could find the life of this person and see how this person makes it through the day. And then I try to complicate this poor fool's life as much as I can to see if they could make it through that day. So no work was, this must be against anti-apartheid. Mm. This must be against, because mm. there's no play like that. Politicians do it. There's no play of, of AIDS right. and COVID-19. The scientists are doing a hell of a good job. But if somebody 
who's supposed to get married, but the bride is on the other side of town. They can't come this side because there's COVID-19. They can't comp- mix. Will the loves survive the 2019 pandemic to 2020 if they've been so separated at the beginning? That was interest me. But you talk about it like this, and there are people who will spend their life trying to write just one great story. And yet for you, I mean, you, you, you're being flippant about it, but this ability to zone in on the individual and to be able to tell that story in a complicated and to make it a beautiful and fascinating and sometimes very frustrating narrative. I mean, this is a, this is a talent. This is not something that uh, everybody can do, John. Well, my grandfather had three wives and could not spell polygamy. He just did three words. What was the problem? You had the problem. So Grandma One told us a story of the Kani clan. She made me believe that I am from royalty. My great-great-grandfather Mjaja was a prince. But what happened was, and then, that I didn't understand then why I would be royalty. Grandma number two brought education and religion. Because my grandfather didn't believe in those things. They said, there's no one up there. My ancestors are in my crawl. Yes. The school, he said, the kids are taken away from the chores of working in the fields, looking up at the goats and cattle. It's nonsense. Now, grandma number three was from Ponderland. She had a tattooed line right in the cross of her face. She was the most beautiful young thing for my grandfather. And she only always talked about gender issues. She really? once asked me, do you know that little girl? I said, yeah. Mpo. He said, do you know her? I said, yeah. We're together at school. She says, when you look at here, what do you see? I said, Mpo. He said, no, no, look again. I said, I don't know what you mean, Grandma. He said, you see me. What you can say to that little girl might be something you can also say to me. What to do to that little girl must be something you know that I will be proud of you. Wow. That was my lesson. That, that's, uh, that's extraordinary. So these three women had a, had a very formative role in, in, in helping you to understand the way the world was. But were there other people as well in, in your early years who had a profound influence in the way you thought about things and how you told and how you were told stories? Because the ancestors, whether people believe in it or not, uh, these are the, the things in our genetic memory, and they help us. And if you, have, if you have some kind of skill or if I have some kind of skill, it's come from somewhere. It didn't just suddenly arrive. You see, with uh, the phenomenon of urbanization, people moving from rural areas or homesteads into the city looking for work, it's a natural phenomenon. Yes. It took away that intergenerational conversation because my grandmother was just behind the house where my father is. So we used to go to my grandmother's place when we don't want to do our chores, and she would tell stories. And she would say, well, you tell a story. He says, no, I can't tell a story. I'm still a child. He says, no, well, tell one of mine. And I would say, no, your stories are too long. Before they're halfway, I'm asleep already. (laughs) Did did you understand? Now families has become me, my wife, and my two kids. That's it. Hmm. It's no longer that family thing where you could relate to the people who are older than you. Even in the community of New Brighton, in those early 50s, you were a child in a village. If I stood somewhere there, once day I was standing with my brothers, and and the dudes were smoking dacha. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I never did. But now, as I'm talking, so this guy says to me, hey, Pastor Zol to Z. So I take the Zol, I'm about to give it to Z, and uh-huh. my uncle is standing right in front of oh, me. No. He says, I knew it, I'm telling my brother now, oh, no. you smoke. And my mother said, he doesn't even smoke. I've checked his pockets when I washed his clothes. He says, Sissy, he had the Zol this big. But he took it upon himself to discipline me, and it was not even my father. <laughs> but that's community. That was community. That is gone. This idea, and it's a very powerful idea, the idea that generations passed down the stories and not only the stories but the history yes of people of families of kingdoms um this is the stuff which i think excites people and you know i can't help thinking that when they cast you in in black panther 
They did that very knowingly because they weren't really just looking for a good-looking man <laughs> who had some wisdom in his eyes. They were looking for someone who could embody in a single expression, which you managed to do without even realizing it, a huge amount of memory, history, stories. There's a saying, when you walk into a room, Gary, do you know why people stop and look? Because you're not alone. Sure. You're walking with about 300 ancestors behind. That's powerful. So you walk into a room, you're already in the majority. And that's where they gravitate towards you and ask you all the silly questions of the crazy things you've done in your life. And you think, well, I just came to have a glass of wine. Why am I the center <laughs> of attention? Because you have that with yourself in belief. We were doing the um, Captain America Civil War. Yes. Uh, uh, with all them big stars and all that. So there's a wonderful scene that Chris Everett has just left because he won't be available for the meeting I'm about to address as King T'Chaka. Right. And then uh, Ch Scarlett Johansson is standing next to this young man, um, Ch uh, Chadwick, Chadwick Bosman, standing there. So they, then he says, uh, I'm going to sit down, Your Highness. I'm sorry about what happened in Nigeria. Now I'm with him, with Chadwick. And I'm saying, I miss you, my son. And I said, excuse me, we're both from Wakanda, and we've agreed that Wakanda is a country somewhere in Africa. So why are we speaking English? Surely me and my son, the others are gone, the Avengers are gone, I should ask him in my language. Yes. And they said, well, um, what would you say? And I said, I just spoke to And Chadwick says, Oh, wow. Stop. How, when did, how do you say that? He says, I did a movie in Cape Town. Oh, wow. And long time ago, and I still retain some of the words the guys from Kailich and Langa from the black communities in that movie were trying to teach me. So I kept the one, Ngiabonga, Ngiabonga, that, meaning thank you. Father. So. The guy from Marvel is sitting, standing on set, making sure that we stick to every nuance of the comic book <laughs> because he says we already have millions of followers of the comic book. Right. So you got to stick to the comic book. You don't want an argument that, well, it's different in the comic book. They lose. You have to be religiously the comic book. And so what so happened? He says, Dr. Can I say that again? So, Nabilinyan. He says, that's the official indigenous language of Wakanda. <laughs> so Just like it's that. closer. <laughs> it's closer. <laughs> so by the time we got to, to the Black Panther, uh, Ryan Kugler had already been talking to me about possibilities, culture and all. He wanted to bring back the, 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 the father so that how would they meet? the mm. father who's already passed away right. with the son who's just the king. I said, we cross these realms of wonder in our, in our mythology. Yes. You close your eyes and you, you dream. That's crossing over. Sometimes you have a vision. You're not sure you're asleep or awake. And suddenly you see someone at the door. You think, I saw someone move there. You're communicating with your ancestors that's where the idea came that he would cross over to the ancestral land and to seek advice to his father. And of course, it's, it's, it's very sad that Chadwick's no longer with oh, us. Oh, so sad. Um, because I think, even though it's complete fiction and fantasy, I think the fact that there was this place in the comic books and in the universe of Marvel called Wakanda gave people in Africa a feeling like, you know, we're there too. Because so much of the stuff is not written for us, unless it's written here, and unless it's about our own actual stories. I think it made people feel like, you know, we're punching here above our weight. We're in the community the, of nations. The impact of a young black child. I went to Burkina Faso, I went to Accra, I went to Buja with the opening of the Black Panther being invited. Some of them happening in open air. Wow. When the thing that, what was funny is that when you see the Black Panther for the first time in the beginning, first scene, it's me younger. Yes. Played by my son, Atandwa Gani. I know Atandwa. It Met takes him. off this thing and they see that the hero in, is not 
Bruce Wayne or so-and-so in Batman or in Superman, there was a black person that took it over. Later, when Chadwick takes the mask off and the kids screaming on the open air, politicians, I was meeting vice president. I'm thinking, live here, I'm getting very famous in Africa very soon. <laughs> but the whole idea that the hero could be like me and the hero who is the centerpiece of this Wakanda of a Black Panther, it looks like me. It gave a different sort of feeling of being great too. So that's what he did with the Black Panther. People felt, yeah, now our stories are told. But that was a comic book story. Sure. We still have to tell our story. We still have to talk about our heroes. We still have to find money because these works, when we tell our stories, I mean, you saw we tried to tell a story of Nelson Mandela. You saw we tried. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. He, you, you meet Mandela, he goes over to circumcision, he comes back as a man, he becomes a lawyer for two sins, and then they send him to Robben Island for life. Yeah. And he sits down in that island, so what? The movie is like 15 minutes. That was the conversation I had with Morgan Freeman. <laughs> yeah, he came to see, him, to talk to Mandela. And what, and what did he say after that? He says to me, it's a difficult role to play, John. It's not like Othello. Because Othello penned its story right through. This guy went to prison and became a model prisoner. Yeah. It is, was not like Al Capone. Al Capone became more dangerous mm. because he had an alibi. He killed more people while in prison because he had an alibi. It's not like God in New York. So he just stayed there. And then you pick him up later when he's negotiating and he become president. So my question with the script is that what do I do between 1964 and 1990 yeah. in the storyline? Correct. So that's what he had, those kinds of challenges in, in, in playing Long Walk to Freedom. You know, we do have beautiful stories, and it, it must frustrate you as much as anyone else that the market is, is cons it, it, the people tell you the market's small. I mean, I don't think it is. I think that good stories will find an audience. I'm sure you agree with me on that. If it's good. If it's good, it finds an audience. They will come. Yeah. You remember that, Kevin Costner? Mm. You build it. Build it. They will, they will come. come. They will. People will walk to Toyando with a GPS that's cutting all the time to see Beyonce. Yeah. But they won't walk yeah. two minutes, right, to Stanton if they don't care about that artist, if that cut is not captivating their imagination, Correct. they won't go. They'll talk about, can't go to Newtown because of the security, the hijackings at night, you know, have to drive back to Soweto after 10, you know, all those things. But it's good they go. So do you worry about theatre? And I'm not trying to put a dampener on what's a very a very lovely, fun conversation so far, but I've been very worried for the 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 fate of South Africa's theatre. But you were there, you saw it through some of the most incredible and challenging times before. But I think what's happening now and trying to get young people to watch live theatre in a world of phones and screens is a very difficult thing to do. Look, I remember in 1990 when Mandela was released, I used to make a joke. We had thousand scripts saying release Nelson Mandela which had to be shredded because we saw him walk out of Robben <laughs> Island. I remember some political parties had printed 30,000 T-shirts, released Nelson Mandela, released politi people, political prisoners, return of Unban the ANC. Unban mm. the ANC. Yeah. There he is. The ANC is unbanned. De Klerk said it in one speech. What are we going to do with these T-shirts? So that's what happened to theatre. Suddenly, the... the the target, the focus, the trajectory. That's what we did theater. Mm -hmm. So while we were creating incredible art stories that reflected our lives, there were a lot of people who got into the industry because it became an industry, not an art form. An industry is where you make money, you create a product and you sell it. Sometimes the product is nonsense. So then we got this position, this point of the ni early 90s to about 95, 96, that the theater was bad. It was because people were really not knowing which way to go. What am I going to talk about? Because the white people was the problem, you see? Mm. Now, if after 94, we're all the problem. 
<laughs> all of us had the problem, and all of us had to come with a solution. We did not have this glorious position of the victim. Yeah. Now, now we created our own victims, and we were also our victims ourselves. So we needed to solve that. So it took a little longer time for the writer to come closer to telling the story. For me, it took me right up, for instance, doing plays and movies. I left everything. It took me to 2003, 2002, that when I started to think, there's a story I want to tell. That's when I wrote nothing but the truth. Mm -hmm. That was me confronting me. Do I forgive? Sure. Why is it still pain in my heart for having survived an assassination with 11 stab wounds as I'm stuck in front, sitting in front of you? Why my brother was killed, being shot, reciting a poem in 1985? Why my uncle spent over 10 years on Robben Island and came back a quiet man? I keep asking, I would joke with him, how was it? He said, mm, it's okay. And I remembered some... Uh, uh, American saying that people who were slaves or enslaved don't want to hand over that baggage to the new generation. So they don't want to tell those stories of how it was. Sure. So finally I got to a point of saying, I'm holding this anger and bitterness in me. I'm too angry. Mm -hmm. I need to do something. I said, I'm going to write a letter to my brother and I leave it on his grave. I'm going to say, Thank you. Your death plus all your peers and your other comrades in the country made me a free person in this democracy. I must remember you with those fond memories rather than see you in a coffin shot three times in your stomach. That's ugly. Let me move on. That's why I wrote nothing but the truth. And from there on, I found my way. The point is that when you look at, you ask about theater, in, in the sort of a bigger picture, mm. we're struggling. Yeah. We're struggling with ideas. We're struggling with commitment. We're struggling with talent. We're struggling with, I don't want to talk funding because theater is never part of, funding is never part of theater. Mm. People created theater and suddenly some Broadway producer says, I like that. I can make money out of that. Right. Some Western producer, some filmmaker says, I like that story. I'll make a film about it. So you can't say the funding is not there when you've not written something that interests the funder. Right. Got to be commercially viable. Yes, because South Africans always like uh, want to tell stories of angst. We want to tell a story when we were suffering, when the Boers were doing this, when the Boers are isolated, when the English are doing this. Those stories are part of history, not to ever to be forgotten. Sure. And when you use those stories, use them as reference. But you have a point to make for the present. And that point must deal also with the future. So the past is now like a reference library and it's closed most of the time. You only open it when you need some information. That's ma that's such a magnificent way of looking at things, and you've articulated it so perfectly that it almost it, I'm almost ruining it by remarking on it. But I do think we get stuck. Yes, um, we get stuck not only you know in theatre and in writing, but I think all of us get stuck. We get stuck in the narratives of two generations ago, and then we aren't busy building the future or making ourselves happy in the present. And we, maybe we like the baggage. Maybe we don't want to pass it on. We, maybe we cling to it because it like gives us identity. It, absolutely. We, 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 we are a Foytok generation. You think it so? always feel sorry for me. And even when you are very successful, you are seen as betraying those that are not. Almost that you can't talk about your success without sort of touching other people who were not successful. You can't even say, I've made money hmm. because I've worked hard. Where do you think, is that the, 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 the famous tall puppy syndrome or is it also, and I can have this conversation with you because I know you won't get upset about it. Is it also a part of Christianity? Is this idea of suffering and the cross and suffering brings you close to Jesus and you mustn't be too happy or too successful because then you forget about the suffering and you're not a good person. Of course, it's a whole colonial perspective that over the 
in country like Africa, or let's take South Africa, you've got to keep the natives always believing that somewhere not now, there's a better place for them. There's a better life for them. So that when you, you, you look at our challenges today, who do you blame? Yeah. It's got to be the devil. Right. You know, and my father right. said, why doesn't the devil just bloody go home? <laughs> and so we stop praying for this guy. <laughs> just let him go home. He belongs somewhere. Or he would say to Pastor so and so, why don't you convert Jesus, I mean, the, the, the devil to go back and be a Christian? Then we don't have problems. <laughs> So why we always, so the, the, the thing about us is that you go to America. I go there twice or three times every year with working on projects. They don't know there's a problem in America. They no. know that it's the greatest place ever. Mm -hmm. They know that it's the center of entertainment. It's a culture center. Everything about them. It's the most powerful nation on earth. It's the most democratic nation on earth. Now, come to South Africa. We tear ourselves down all, all the time. The time. I couldn't all agree the more. time. We criticize each other. We are and character. for what? Nothing. Nothing good comes of it. Nothing. It's it, just, it, I can't it, see it demoralizes you us. I can't see you successful. You, you are working with us in a very nice place, right? And then you decided to break away from us and to go on your own journey. Oh my God, we're gonna cut you down for the rest of your life. Because you couldn't have made it on your own. Because if you stayed in the group of complainers, you would have been like us. You're branching out and leave and find your own voice is making us uncomfortable. Therefore, we are going to find reasons of your success. We may even say there are things you do that we can talk about, but we're still investigating. We're not even in the SEUI, what is ISU? This investigating units, but yeah. we always want to know why are you successful? We don't applaud success. We don't. We don't. In no. every sphere, you make money, got to be some money from somewhere. Crooked. It's crooked yeah, somewhere. Something's going on. It's worse if you're black, it comes from tenders. Big time. It's tenders. Big time. You see, so you go like, uh, well, the English, the economy is collapsing. They don't even know. They're still talking English. <laughs> they don't even know, you know. But one thing the English know is entertainment. They have got many theatres all over the UK. Yeah. And they're doing work. The work is light because they know that you've been through a hell of a day. You take one break, me and the missus, or me and my friends, we want to see a musical this evening. You don't want to sit there and worry oh, and no, have an existential God. crisis. Crisis and tell me <laughs> that there's AIDS and there is, more, there is what you call COVID-19. There's another strand. There's an, yeah. They don't care about it. They just say, let's celebrate who we are. Let's entertain. Let's enjoy our lives. It's not long anyway. That's, so that's let's get true. on with it. Then you come to us in, in, in Africa as a whole. It's always, always, I was saying to my son about these many coups that's happening all over Africa, I said, if these guys came from outside and they came to change the government because they have been witnessing it doing wrong, I'm happy with that. But these are number twos to the corrupt leader right. that move yeah. the leader out, they take over, not because it's their time, because it's their turn. Right. And they don't improve things most. No, because they were number two. Yeah. They've, they le they've already learned the bad habits. They learned and they were benefiting from the bad habits. I mean, as someone who tells stories, the, 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 the real story of South Africa, the sad part of this, and then we will move to happier things. Because yes. I want to talk to you a bit about Shakespeare. I know you're a man who loves, loves Shakespeare. But the... The, the current dispensation in this country learned most of their bad habits from the previous one. Of course. And they, they continue. They're not even self-aware enough to know that a lot of the terrible things they do to themselves, to the country, to the people of this country, are habits they've learned from their enemies who they were meant to have improved upon. Th that, that to me is like a cycle that we can't break. It's a pattern. It's yeah. a stencil. We work within the given confine. We were, uh, we thought that Mandela gets released. 
After a long time when we, there was exile, we used to communicate and engage and the vision of a better South Africa, of a new South Africa, of a non-racial, non-sexist South Africa. Discussions were being, I mean, met, panels discussing. And suddenly, it was almost like not ready to hear this news. Mandela will be released. Oops, okay, we were not there yet. Uh, we have not done the full preparation of that, <laughs> right? And this side, of course, uh, I was supposed, I was surprised that Declerc made that speech and still walked out. I thought he was going to be killed on his way to his car. Mm -hmm. So all the people of South Africa did not get the opportunity for an indaba, right? Of saying have an a, an intern, temporary structure that takes over from Declerc made of the government of national unity. It's not the government yet. Right. And all the thinkers, the philosophers, the political-minded people, we all go away somewhere beyond Bruderdom, mm, and we mm, close mm. in a crawl, and we work out what would a be right. proper Indaba. Yeah, uh, Indaba, mm. where what would be right for us, coming from this history of years of colonization, 60 years of apartheid, now we are at this point. And part of those conversations, we say there should be truth and reconciliation, good. There should be this, good. But how are we going to govern? Yeah. What kind of government we are going to set up? Right. That would immediately address the urgent issues of creating a, a society that's equal. We didn't have that time. It was from Chris mm. Hani and from Boy Patong and from that and from the AWB. And thought, no, no, let's go to elections as very quickly as we can. <laughs> now we've got a new government. Who goes where? Okay, <laughs> Mandela be president. There's a story. He said no three times. Yeah. When he was asked to be. You're right. It was apparently Walter who said, then we're going to tell the people you don't want to lead. He said, well, one term. One term. I'm too old. And he did that. Yeah. I'm he stuck not, to his word. I don't know this country. I'm too old. Hmm. I have not been here for a long time. Now, those are the challenges we have. We almost like got into the pool and were swimming and we are learning to swim. Mm -hmm. After 30 years, if you look back, it's not a disaster. We haven't had the coup. We haven't had That's civil true. war. Yeah. We haven't had the total collapse of our economy. We haven't had all the other things that happened, even to America. But we're struggling to get to a point where we are strong enough to say now we can implement the new vision of a new South Africa. And so many of these stories are age old. You know, we think we're the only ones that are dealing with corruption the only ones who are dealing with unemployment. But even the great classics are full of stories like this. Yes. I mean, isn't Hamlet the story of, of this kind of struggle with power? Julius Caesar is the same. Julius. Coriolanus. Is which, the same. You know, Coriolanus is the same. Yeah. It's, it's amazing how this young man called William Shakespeare, <laughs> in a very short space of time in his life, had written these stories because before him in the Greek mythology and the Elizabethan and the Victorian age, it was always good versus bad. Yeah. It was always these guys are the enemy and there's a war and then who won? He went into the feelings, the senses, senses of hate, fear, love, you know, and conflict within oneself. He dealt with human behavior. So in that way, his works will lend themselves today when you watch a play that was written in 1514, in 1614. Yeah. You know, I remember when I did Othello uh, for the first time at the Market Theatre in 1987. The cast itself, when asked, oh, you're doing Othello, my God, yes. Oh, who's directing? Janet Sussman, great British actress and South African. Okay, who's playing Iago? Oh, Richard Haynes, brilliant actor. May... His soul rest in peace. Yep. An incredible human being who was like my partner sharing that journey. When asked, who's playing Othello? Well, the market theater wants John Carney to play Othello. Now, my conditions in playing Othello, I don't want an adaptation. I don't want a version that would suit South Africa. I was a director in 1972, if Donald Howarth, he did at the Space Theater in Cape Town, Othello's 
slechts blank is. <laughs> this, this play, Othello did not appear at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you, you wanted to be true to the original. True to the original, because I wanted to challenge me. And I mean, that's a roll and a half, hey? I wanted to deal with this because that's, that, that, that is an unfair, an unfair division of lines here. Hmm. Three quarters of the play is Iago. <laughs> and, yeah. and poor Othello has to make his, uh, some life out of himself with a quarter of the dialogue, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and but what was for me exciting is that people were stunned at the market theater. Oh, my God. This story. I remember coming down the aisle with Richard Haynes, and there is Joanna Weinberg, who played Othello, talking to Neil McCarthy. Those were great actors. What happened to these young people? <laughs> and suddenly this Iago says, isn't that your wife there with Cassio? And this mama says, he's talking rubbish. He's just a friend. That guy, that guy has no <laughs> affair with your wife. <laughs> and Richard went back and says, I can't take it. This is a pantomime. He was angry at how really? the old, yeah, he was freaking out. I can't take this. That people hated Iago. And I said, well, I play Othello in the play, but now, as the artistic director of the market theater, you will. <laughs> wow. Can I come out of that and go to the play now? Now, well, I've done my official role. Right. So let's do it. And he was unbelievable. Actors are different creatures. You've directed so many, um, and you've written for so many. And, and we had Seloma Kekangube here in the studio just the other day. He was talking about his role in Nothing But The Truth. Mm -hmm. um, and he said he loved it. And he said it was, it was a, an absolute unparalleled honor for him to be doing this, this work of yours with you, showing him how... Some directors and actors just get on like a house on fire. And sometimes there's a lot of friction, right? Well, you see... <laughs> When you're a doctor, you have a piece of paper, a certificate, and a seven-year study that qualifies you and makes you work as a doctor. Right. You're a journalist, you study, and then you understand the words and you tell your stories, but you have an educational background. You don't come from a sunlight soap ad mm. into a beer ad, into another brandy ad, and now you're in an episode as an actor. There are certain things that your body, your psyche the philosophy within you cannot interpret as in, because now you are in the business of repeating words. And then the worst part of it, you then get into the television soapies and series where you're given sides on arrival that morning, these are your lines. Or you can say them in Zulu, Tonga, Pedi, whatever way you can say them because you're not important in the telling of the story. You're just one of the vehicles. Huh. Therefore, then people at the end of the day do not grow. There's nothing wonderful for me to see an actor step when the lights come up and they're shit scared. Horrible. It's frightening. Even now, even now, when I step on stage, <laughs> I'm always thinking... It's been a fluke. All this success has been a fluke. I'm going to be found out. Imposter, I, imposter syndrome. It, I'm telling you. I'm standing at the, at the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford. I've written the play called Kunene and the King. And I'm with Sir Anthony Shea, whose name is all over the, the Royal Shakespeare in Stratford. And it open and we come in. And he first goes in alone. And he's busy. I knock on the door. I come in. I get an acknowledgement of a round of applause. Oh. From 650 Beautiful. very English people. Beautiful. <gasps> good. They must have good taste. They must have good taste. <laughs> that then will take you a deep breath. But then sometimes we complain that people don't come to the theater. The worst at marketing for a theater as a building or work of an artist is a bad play. Oh, yes. And the double worst one is a bad actor who really doesn't know what the hell is going on. Then people will associate this bad play with your venue. And they will say, the last thing I went to see at that theater was terrible. 
is going to take them a lot of time. We haven't got disposable income. And it's not safe to drive at night, mm -hmm. sit in the play while you are thinking, I'm going to have to drive out of this theater and go back to North Northcliff. Mm -hmm. That's a hell of a drive. I've got to drive to Soweto. And I'm going to not do mm -hmm. that for a bad play. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you mentioned your son, Atandwa. And obviously the artistic streak runs in the family too, just as it came from your grandmothers. Um, would you ever dissuade them from going into the arts? Because a lot of people who are in it say, oh, no, 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 rather become, as your father tried yes. to talk you into being a lawyer, rather become a doctor. Or a, I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've met your kids and they're smart, they're intelligent, they could have done anything. Well, when you grow up in, in the theatre, one day I say to my wife, take the kids, we're going to see a play. They come to see my play. I wasn't aware what I'm doing. Hmm. That was when I was, the seed was planted in one of them. Right. But I was just giving them a, a, an exposure to the arts and maybe make them see some references of life that they would use in different areas where they would operate or work or live. That was my idea. So they, they know about theater. They don't have to be actors because they go to the theater. They don't have to be writers just because my father is also a writer. So then he says to me, 2003, after he passes my trick, he says, um, I ask him, what are you going to do next? He said, well, I want to look at sort of political relations and political science and all that. I said, that's good. You see, I'm connected, you see. I right. know guys in government. <laughs> I, I can get him a, a, a job at the, at the Washington, D.C., in, in the embassy. I right. can get him one in London. I can talk to my brothers to Tabombegi. He could place him in, in, in Paris, you know. <laughs> and then I, I'm about to go on, on stage on, at the Lincoln Center, and we're talking to my wife on the phone. He says, oh, Atanda wants to talk to you. Uh -huh. I said, hi, yeah, how are you doing, bro? He said, no, dad, I'm fine. I'm in. I said, yeah, at Wits University. I said, great, drama. <laughs> he said, that's exactly <laughs> why I didn't tell you. Oh, it's that wow. pause. Oh, wow. I've been saying great, great, and suddenly he says drama. I went, that's good. <laughs> he said, that's why <laughs> I didn't tell you. Now, my way of thinking it. Is it daddy's name? Is it daddy's success that he thinks I could ride on that and be also? Or is there a little iota of a talent in him that would sustain his life? Because this is not easy. Mm -mm. This is up and down and more downs than up. Yeah. Right. And slowly then while he was at Wits, I went to see what he was doing, a Melio of Miser play. I said to my wife, he can act. Let's shut up. What a relief. <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> now he's in Cape Town. Yes. Guess what he's doing? Othello. Oh, my God. At the Baxter Theatre. You've been to see it yet? Baxter Theatre, directed by Lara Foote. I did it in 1987. Unbelievable. In 2024. He's stepping wow. in my shoes. He says to me, what can you say? I said, nothing. It just requires courage. Just be brave and just believe in yourself. I am nothing to do with it. By the way, can we have a coffee? Change subject. <laughs> <laughs> That's very clever to change the subject. That mm. is that is a truly uh, great skill that most fathers don't have. <laughs> they don't have the ability to act their way out of there. Uh, that, I mean, that must be a, a, a very proud moment. I mean, all these things that, that you see your kids achieve, you must be proud of them. Do you think your father would be proud to know that you were where you are now, that you've done the things you've done? How much of it did he get to see? He went in 1973 mm. at the St. Stephen's Church Hall. He was told that he's got to see this play. It was me and Winston in Sizwebanze is dead. Really? There was 150 seats. There were 700 people standing. We had to even put some of them on the stage. And the police cars were parked outside. And my father said, I will never, ever go see the rubbish he's doing. We're nearly arrested this evening. <laughs> I don't know why he is trying to provoke these boas. Doesn't he understand they break his neck? He oh was my God. very angry. 
1984, I go back to Port Elizabeth. I'm doing Master Harold and the Boys. Yeah. Now, in this scene, this little white boy spits on my face. In this scene, I drop my pants. So mom and dad came to see the play at the opera house in Port Elizabeth. And then at the end of the play, I said, bye-bye, Dada. So I go see him at home uh, the following day. He says, you're a bit too hard on the boy. I said, why? He said, look, he's still growing. I'm thinking, how am I going to explain why I allow this white boy to spit on my face? Yeah. And t- taught me to drop my was pen. His, this was his takeaway? Yes. <laughs> that I went very hard on him to tell him the story of his alcoholic father who I used to carry on my back through the streets of White Port Elizabeth because he was crippled. That was the real story of Arthur Fugger's father. Right. I told him that story and I reminded him the day I made a kite for him, how he's as happy, how dare he now wants to call me a boy. Hmm. And my father says, you were too hard on the boy. Wow. 1977, I come back from the England. I've been doing the wild geese, and I got paid about 12,500 pounds. My father says, I hear people are saying you're a millionaire. Where's the money? Can I see it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're right. <laughs> but now, my father always explained what I do. He said, my other brother is a chief mechanic. My younger brother is Reverend Kani. My sister is a teacher. So-and-so is this, so-and-so is this. Uh, what happened to John? He's always away. That was me. You were always away. Always away and is worried about me. Mm. 1985, I come back from New York and he's sitting with his friends. I used to buy him the Red Hat Rum. Yes. The liter bottle. Right. Right, at duty free. So he's sitting with his friends and I, I says... Uh, you're back from New York? Yeah, I'm back. So I put the bottle there. He looks around. He says, hey, guys, this is my son. John Gunny is an actor. Ah. Ah. He died three months later. But recognition. He found the words in his mouth to say with pride. Beautiful. This is John Gunny. He's my son. He's an actor. So you ask me the highlights of my career? It would be that moment where I could not say a word. I just walked out. Finally said it. You got to repeat that with Atandwa, huh? It's his life. Hmm. We, we'll bump into each other. I've directed him three <laughs> times and he reported me to mom that I'm hard on him. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm, I'm hard on him. <laughs> I I'm so uh, pleased that we got to have this this catch up, and I know that there are so many people in this country who have uh, in the in the world of theatre and the arts um, haven't got to to hear how grateful the country is for what they've done, and I'm glad that we've got you here still to show us and to tell us the stories and to and to and to make us laugh and make us cry and make us think and make us love and make us hate. It's a tremendous power that you have, and you are absolutely one of the best people. So thank you. Well, I must say, I am one of those few who the country has acknowledged. I have an order of Ikamanga in silver from President Thabo Mbeki. Quite right. I have a Tony Award on Broadway. Quite right. I have an OB on off Broadway. In the 31st of August, 1975, is the John Carney and Winston Jonah Day in Washington, the District of Columbia. The 9th of, set, the 9th of October is the John Carney Day in the state of New York. I've just been honored by the uh, Voices of Freedom. My previous recipients of that honor was Nelson Mandela, Albertina Sisulu, and Bishop Tutu. Sure. I've Steam. just now been honored by... Uh, um, the Kennedy Center. Foundation as the J.F. Kennedy Gold Medal. Unbelievable. A couple of days ago, the Department of Foreign Affairs, Derko, honored me with Ubuntu Cultural Diplomacy uh, Veterans Award, acknowledging 50 years of my working abroad hoisting the flag. The last one, I've just been honored by King Charles III, King Charles right. III, right. with an OBE. 
fantastic. It is the officer of the most excellent order of, of the, the British Empire. Order of the British Empire. Now, if I was a British citizen, that that means a knighthood. A knighthood, correct. But I'm not. So uh, I said, no, I'm riding with John Can. It's fine. Because I, I won't no, get work. No, we, we, could, we could get away with calling you no, Dr. No. Sir John Carney. No, that's, bad, that's be too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, John, you know, um, just uh, mm. just again, mm. because you're such a, an easy person to talk to, and those are not even all the awards. Those are not no, all the honors. No, no, no. I and, I know, and I know that there are probably many more to still come. What, are, you, are you feeling pleased, accomplished, and satisfied? Is there still a burning passion for you to do more? Are you happy to see your grandchildren grow up? Or do you still have work to do? I still have work to do. Looking, I love this country. I'm, I'll be 81 in August. And I know where we come from. I was 51 years old when I voted for the first time in my life. Now where we are now worries me. It gives me sleepless nights. It makes me ask the question, is there anything that I haven't done, could have done, that would have changed the trajectory, the history, the direction of the country? Looking at the young generation, there's such a gap from me and the next one. There is no, don't, you know what you don't find in journalism? The young people coming up who are, mm. who, who are news readers, and then I see them talk to people on the street, and then next time they're interviewing the politicians, they're interviewing <laughs> a scientist about this. You think these people are extremely genius. How do they know everything? <laughs> and you think that was not in our time. Our time we worked. We did a research on this story. When the, before we could even interview the person, we found out a lot about it. And we knew whatever we would do during the interview will feed positivity. Ubuntu, and, and, and encourage people to grow. This time is, when you heard that your father was shot, how did you feel? I mean... I live a year. What My a father just shot, you want to know what I feel? I want to kick your ass and move on, you. You see, that's for me, there's this gap that, um, that in politics, in life, general, social, medical, everywhere, there's this area that... We haven't found the words or the formula to kickstart it into moving towards creating a better South Africa. I don't know. My mother used to say, you're not Jesus. You can't solve everybody's problems. <laughs> I said, but I can try at least. Maybe we need to make a suggestion that this is, these are the issues. I, I, I tweeted something being naughty. I said, the elections are coming 2024. I want to vote in 2024. But please, party people, don't tell me what the other party is not doing. Right. You tell me well, how you're going to make an impact in my life. Oh, by the way, I'm an artist. <laughs> right. Damn right. And if, they're not paying, if they haven't been paying attention for, what, 50, 60 years now, what are you going to do for them? They What's need to wake up. I think it's so important. <clears throat> what you just said now is just absolutely beautiful because none of our work is finished. No. And if you at 81 are not going to give up, then the rest of us have bloody cheek doing anything <laughs> less. <laughs> thank you, sir. It's such a pleasure and a privilege to spend time with thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great coming here again. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you.